Okay, well, hi everyone, and thank you very much for watching or listening. Liam Hartley back with you today with another episode of the Simply Inspired podcast. And I must say, I'm very honored and humbled to bring you a very, very special guest that I'll be talking with today. Now, Daiju Zenjai, hopefully I'm saying that the right way, Simon Rowe, best-selling author, Buddhism teacher, ordained in the Rinzai Zen Buddhist tradition, also an ACA counselor as well. This man does some incredible work, touching a lot of lives through his teaching, books, talks. And today we're going to be finding out a little bit more about his incredible journey into becoming the man that he is today, helping so many people. And we are going to be finding some useful tips and techniques that you, the viewers, can use to find more inner peace in your life. We'll be touching on a better understanding of meditation as well and some other very useful topics. So I would like to say, my friend, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening for this. I'm very, very grateful for that. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, from uh, yeah, from nighttime here in Australia, bedtime here in Australia, to morning there in uh, Malta, I believe. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's it's absolutely amazing how we can reach around the world like this, not across just across distance, but across time as well in, in many ways. So anyway, we'll talk about um, a number of, of aspects of your life. And I know you do a lot of talks like this, so this may be a very simple question for you. But for anyone who doesn't know, in terms of the beginnings of your journey into Buddhism and how you found Buddhism. I think I would like to start there because there's so many people out there who are searching for an answer. They don't know where to look. And obviously once I'd imagine you were in a similar position yourself. So I'd like to start with that topic, please, if that's okay. Thank you. Of course. For a Zen monk writing about self talking about self is, is a difficult thing um, and that's that's a, a huge topic in and of itself um, when I wrote my book one of the one of the first bits of advice that I was given by the proofreaders was write about yourself and that was hard that was probably the hardest two pages of the book to write um, when we identify with ourself that opens up so many doors to delusions to ignorance to anger to greed um, but on the other hand it's only through this concept of self that we can actually learn to become something bigger um, and that was pretty much my journey I, I was an avid reader um, I used to head down my local library with my family this of course was pre-internet um, pre-horse and cart as my children would like to tell me but uh, but pre-internet um, and I would one of my favourite areas of reading was in the religion's other section. I was brought up a Christian. Um, some of my family still remain Christian. Um, but for me, it was religion other. It was the Greeks, the Romans, um, and, and eventually the Eastern religions as well. Uh, one day when I was quite young, I was reading uh, a series of Eastern stories and one of them was about the Parinirvana or the death of the Buddha. And as the monks were standing around the Buddha and they were, they were crying and they were saying, Master, why are you leaving us? Why are you leaving us? The Buddha looked at them and said, have you learned nothing from my teachings? They said, but what will we do when you're gone? And he said, my teachings are that you should become a lamp unto yourself. And I was very young. I was, I was 9, 10, 11, 12, very young. And this thing hit me like a, like a, a bullet in the forehead. I just, it's something about it was so powerful, even back then. And I carried that through my later years. What did it mean to be a lamp unto yourself? I mean, the Buddha was dying and he was telling his, his disciples, Look to yourself, don't look to me. And what did that mean? As I went on in my life, um, I faced a lot of troubles, I faced a lot of issues, um, an amazing amount of them self-created, like, like always happens when we're going through our youth. And for me, that all culminated in one weekend. I, I, had, uh, I had 
substance abuse issues, I had relationship issues, I had work issues, um, and I was still an avid reader. I just finished reading the amazing Musashi by Iji Yoshikawa, um, which is a fantastic book if you get the chance to read it. And all this impacted me in the space of one weekend. It all just came to a critical mass. And at this moment, I, I remembered this quote from the Buddha, be a lamp unto yourself. And as is often the case, I completely misinterpreted it. And I thought, you know what I have to do is I have to go and live harder. So I went off and I bought a house and I got engaged and I got a better job and I just found better substances to abuse. At dinner parties, big parties. And this went on for probably three more years. And then this time the implosion was severe. And it wasn't until I started doing suicide counselling 10 years later that I realised exactly how deep a hole I dug for myself by living harder, not searching deeper. Um, and I was walking through my hometown of Adelaide. I was walking down beautiful North Terrace, looking at the buildings. And again, it wasn't until years later that I realised I was going past these things, perhaps to say goodbye. Um, I, I, I didn't really know how deep I was in, but I knew I was in pretty bad. And just by chance, I walked past the Adelaide uh, Music Conservatorium and they had a one gold coin, uh, which is an Australian one or $2 piece, uh, a one gold coin music um, recital. And I walked in and I sat down and just sat there. And this young girl came out, this woman came out, and she started singing St. Matthew's Passion. And the only way I can describe it is if you were to hold a piece of glass, a sheet of glass, and then tap it with a hammer, the sheet of glass would just shatter into a million pieces. And that's what happened to me. I fell apart uh, publicly and quite loudly. And it was the 80s, so, well, sorry, the early 90s. So things weren't quite as uh, quite, quite as caring as they are now, so security came and escorted me out and I just wept as I made my way home um, over the space of a couple of hours. I think I walked home. And, um, and I realised I still hated myself. I still didn't like who I was. But that didn't mean that my life was worthless. And I suddenly realised the first step of being a lamp unto yourself was that perhaps instead of trying to find some sort of solution for myself, I could use my life to benefit others. Instead of living for myself, which I didn't really see the point of, perhaps if I lived for other people. And that for me was the first step. Um, my fiancé and I had already broken up. She had another living in the same house, fun times. Um, within three months, I'd sold the house to her. I'd sold all my possessions and packed a backpack this big and left for India and was going to go and find a teacher worthy of teaching me. Um, and that's really how it started. I, I didn't have some great moment, a flash of light, no great inspiration. The Buddha didn't come to me riding on some golden unicorn. It was that I had reached the bottom and I had felt that the only way to climb back out was to stop focusing on myself and start focusing on everything else around me. Well, that is a powerful story, my friend, I must say. And uh, I really respect the vulnerability of sharing that, even though I know that's a big part of what you do. I must say that, by the way, because there is a lot of courage uh, in being that light for other people. And I'd like to go a little bit further into that process for the reference of uh, people who are not familiar with this in terms of the renunciation, because I do feel that there's some common uh, misunderstandings around that that perhaps you can clarify, including the monastic life. And uh, when I've spoken to other people, there's 
definitely some some misconceptions. So certainly touching on that as a subject in terms of what you experienced physically, but also what you experienced internally, which is really what this talk is all about. And I, I also must say, so I don't forget what you were saying there, focusing on others and helping others. That's why I do these talks in the first place, by the way. So when you're sharing some of what you've been through, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. So the, um, the process of your spiritual journey, you mentioned India there. I'm not sure if you perhaps you tried different uh, teachers before you settled on one, but let's go a little bit deeper into that process, please. That would be great. Thank sure. you. Thank you. So, um, look, really, it's, it, it is a long process. We have a saying in Zen, which is that the the teacher doesn't find the, the student, the student finds the teacher. And that was my process. So initially I went to Nepal and Nepal was a great, at the time, I don't know what it's like now, it's been a while, but at the time it was a great starter for, for India. You know, you, your mistakes in Nepal weren't going to cost you too much, whereas, you, you know, your mistakes in India could be, could be challenging. Um, so I spent my time in Nepal, and that was the first time I learned to sit meditation. And in fact, the reason why I wrote my book was to take, and the, the courses that I teach for corporates and individuals and that sort of stuff, is, is to take someone who's never sat Zen meditation before and teach them the posture and teach them the mental state and to teach them how to in, integrate that into their life. Um, I had nothing <laughs> like that. I had a book that showed me the posture, and I remember sitting in a in a Nepalese hotel room, um, taking my legs into the quarter lotus posture, which I can now sit for days in without flinching. I managed to make 36 seconds before the pain became too unbearable, and I couldn't take it anymore. The next day, I managed to make double that, and I just kept working, making my legs more flexible, making my body adapt to the posture. I didn't know then what I do now and what I teach now is a lot of the tricks that I learned along the way in terms of how to relax the body because really sitting meditation even for 10 minutes for someone who's never done it before is a real challenge. In the monastery we sit between 5 and 16 hours a day so if there's any kinks in your body and the way you sit it's really painful. So for me, initially, the first stage was learning how to sit meditation. Then I went down to India and I moved to the town of Bodh Gaya, which is famous for being the town uh, where the Buddha originally uh, achieved enlightenment. And there's a beautiful Mahabodhi stu stupa there, and there's a clone of the original Bodhi tree that the Buddha uh, is said to have had uh, his experience under. And, yeah, I trained with quite a few teachers, uh, Chokin Imirin who's from the Chogzen lineage of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, which is very similar in many ways to Zen. He was a fantastic teacher. I was very inspired by him. He wasn't my teacher, but he he was a real highlight for me. Um, you could just sense his understanding. Um, I studied with Govinka, who's a Theravada teacher, which is the Southern School of Buddhism. They're the ones who wear the, the yellow robes or the saffron-coloured robes, um, and that was in Mindfulness of Vipassana. Um, again, not my style of meditation. It's very popular here in Australia, but um, but not my style of meditation. Um, a great teacher, though, but but not my style. Eventually, I learned Zen meditation from a Japanese monk of the Theravada school, the Southern School of Buddhism. And um, I asked him, I said, why are you teaching me Zen meditation when you belong to a different school? You belong to the Theravada school. And he says, because I have vowed to help any, li any living being who wants to progress further along the path. And I said, why is that? And he said, because I can't live enough lives to atone for this life. There's nothing I can do in all the lives that I can live to atone for this life. So you, me teaching you Zen meditation, if that is enough to progress you along the path, then I hope I can atone for some of the things that I've done. And I said, what is it that you've done? And he said I was a machine gunner in Nanjing. And I don't know if anyone listening understands World War II, but the Japanese... 
uh, actions in Nanjing are terrible. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a military historian. It's one of my hobbies. Um, and uh, I immediately understood his his pain. I immediately understood why he couldn't live enough lives to atone for what he'd done. So he taught me, and he taught me well. Um, I also studied with the Dalai Lama. Um, he was definitely not my teacher, but he's a he's a a lovely guy, and I could probably fill up this whole hour with a few stories about him. Um, and so yeah, we used to I used to chant with Dalai Lama and some of the Tibetan monks, and we would just chant and meditate around the the the, the Bodhi tree and the Mahabodhi temple. But this wasn't my path. Um, Bod Guy was beautiful. I got a chance to meet Buddhists from all different types. I mean, if you can imagine your work, you sit down with other people who do it and you talk about what happens at work and you talk about how things, you know, how things work, what's it like in your office, what's your boss like, what's it this like. For us to be able to sit down with people from all over the world who are studying the deepest levels of Buddhism and over over a cup of tea and, and fresh cinnamon scrolls and just just to talk about Buddhism was, was, for me, one of the highlights of my life. But it wasn't training. So um, I jumped on a plane and flew to Japan. I went from, from India, which was hot, to Japan, where it was bloody cold, and ended up for uh, a couple of months in a training monastery where I had to learn to sit enough time. Um, we're sitting hours at the time, and... I wasn't up to that stage yet. We had to learn how to eat. There's a lot of a lot of formality when it comes to eating. Um, we've got sutras that we have to chant every morning and evening. So there's the book book of sutras to uh, to learn from, um, and just the formality of living in a monastery. It's a very formal place. There's a lot of rules to follow um, for obvious reasons. So, yeah, the training monastery was the first step. And then finally, um, I went to my monastery of Sogenji, Sogenji and met my master, Shoto Harada Roshi. And, yeah, the this, this, this student found the master, um, I think. Yeah, the, the day he accepted me into the monastery was, was probably one of the most important of my life. Um, and he was hard. Um, but... I was, in many ways, I'd achieved my wish. I died. I killed myself. And something else was born. Before that was Simon. After that was Daiju. Uh, my mum and the government still call me Simon. Um, I mean, sometimes I use it because I just can't be bothered explaining Daiju. But, uh, but yeah, um, maybe I had achieved my wish of killing myself in a way. Absolutely. It makes sense. And what I love about this is the relatability, quite frankly. I mean, part of the reason I'm asking you specifically about your experiences, despite the fact, as you said at the beginning, talking about the concept of self, you know, it is unusual in, in this context, but at the same time, it's relatable for those people out there who are lost and especially those people out there who are going through um, some of what you went through before, essentially, to, to simplify that. So I, I do really appreciate the, the vulnerability of that, as I've already mentioned before. Something I would like to touch on, though, with this concept is obviously the level of discipline that it takes, you know. So one of the things I'm aware of here, my friend, is what you said there, sharing an experience. It's not about knowledge, it's about practice in a lot of ways. Or well, I mean, knowledge is, is very important, but the, uh, as you know all too well, practice is what, what creates all of this. So I do appreciate that when you're describing it, words are often, of course, substitute for experience. Although I must say, sitting in your presence, I can feel the many years of practice, if, if that makes sense. But one of my questions for you, with the discipline, going back to what you said earlier about, you know, 36 seconds, then double that, and now it's many, many hours or even days, as you said. I'm fascinated by, obviously, you build that up, but do you think you were innately born with some form of discipline, or do you think it's something that anyone can build up to with the right practice? I know that that might seem obvious in a way, but I think there's a, an interesting subject hidden behind this, if that makes sense. Thank you. 
I think you've given me two two ways to approach that, and I, and I like that. When it comes to, yes, I've done some extraordinary things, and I accept that, and I don't say that with any sense of ego because, honestly, these things to me are so commonplace. It's really only when I talk to others that I get reflected back to me how rare my life has been. Um, and likewise, sometimes it's not a great reaction. Um, and I know, for instance, my wife, for instance, it took her a long time to get used to me because there's things that I just don't react to that the normal person would. Um, because I see things in a very different way. I experience things in a very different way. Um, as to whether it was something innate in me, look, the Buddha once said that the chance of being born human is the same as finding a single speck of grain, a single, single, single grain of sand on a beach. It's the chance of finding one specific star in the sky. And I write about this in my book. If you take into account the amount of biomass on this planet, just ants alone make up, I believe, 80% of all the human biomass on the planet. Just ants alone. Consider their, their size. Each one of them has a consciousness. How many ants does it take to make one human? Now, obviously, our consciousness is, is more evolved than an ant's, but that is still a sentient being. That is still a creature that was born, will live, will die. We are born, we live, and we will die. But as humans, we have the incredibly rare opportunity to use this life. Most people live their lives, as one of their master said, with two great denials. One is that we will die. And two is that we're in denial of that fact. As a monk, um, I often did palliative care. I would sit with someone. In fact, one of my specialities with counselling is grief and loss and death. And as someone is dying, I will sit with them and match my breath with theirs and be a presence for them. I'm not a guide. This is their life. It's not mine. There's nothing they can gain from me. But I can be with them and share that moment and make sure that they've got someone with them as they go through one of the intrinsically human acts, which is dying with consciousness. As for you know, the discipline involved, it takes a phenomenal amount of effort to realise that the things that we see and the things that we hear and the things that we feel and the emotions that we have are lying to us. I'm not colourblind. Are you colourblind? No. Mm. Do you see red the same colour as I do? Well, I get, because people have always told me it's red from the time I was born, and that's a shared experience, supposedly with others. But yes, from that perception, I see red, yes. When I'm underwater, if I get a cut underwater um, uh, once, we were about 10 metres deep and my wife got bitten by a more eel, but her blood was black because there's not enough red light coming down there. So what's changed? Has the blood changed? No, it's the circumstances and it's our perception of it. Now, obviously, this is a trite example. It's a small example. But if you expand that outwards, how are we sure that everything that we experience in our day-to-day -day life is exactly what we think it to be? We make decisions based on how we perceive a person, how we perceive an event. But those are not based on an objective, real position, but based on a subjective 
position. I like this person because I find them attractive. I don't like this person because they follow a different football team to me. The discipline you need in a Zen monastery is there to for two reasons. First of all, to create an environment where anything extraneous is taken away from us, and we can get to that later if you want. But secondly, to make sure that you're constantly coming back to these two main great points. I am alive. I will suffer. I will die. How am I using that? This breath that I'm taking and I'm feeling pass through my body, would I act the same way if I knew that was to be my last ever breath? Would I be talking to you or would I be running naked through the streets screaming or would I be sitting down watching reality TV? If you knew you had one minute left, Liam, what would you do? Not to sound cliche, uh, if, I, if I could do it in a minute, I would tell the people I love most that I care for them, actually, um, to be perfectly honest with you. I, everything else pales into insignificance, including, as, as you know all too well, any of my own uh, so-called desires. So one minute left, I would tell them in person or pick up the phone, to be honest. Beautiful. And as a monk, we live constantly with the awareness that this breath is my last breath. As soon as I breathe this breath and let it go, I will never have it again. As soon as I wave goodbye to my wife in the morning if she's going off somewhere, I will never have that chance again. And there's no guarantee she's going to return back. Same as my children. At night when I tuck them in, I give them a kiss. Good night. What if I die in my sleep? What will be their last memory of me? As a monk, part of the discipline that we have is to train ourselves to constantly come back to this point. This is my life. This is all I've got. There's no life after this. If there is, I don't remember it. Do you remember it? Even if it is, even if we've been reincarnated a million times, we can't remember it. So this is it from this consciousness point of view. How do we use it? How do we suck the most out of every experience? And give it back. Beautiful description. It's fantastic. And another thing that that leads me to, my friend, which I'm very curious to mention here, because we started off this this call with you saying a very apt point about for a Zen monk to be talking about a sense of self. And I find that fascinating, to be honest. It's been fascinating all the way through. And one of the things that keeps occurring to me is obviously being such a well-known and well-respected individual, you know, being a counsellor, a speaker internationally, a, a best-selling author, and so on and so forth. There is an element of fame. There is an element of um, renown, or I'm not sure how you define it, but that form of people's awareness of you. And I find that fascinating because... The sense of self, as we, we've said, it's, it's not there. Also, the fact what we said earlier that Simon is long gone and, and you're different now, but people still respond to you. So it's possibly also a simple question for you, but I think people listening, especially people who are not familiar with some of these topics, will be fascinated by your response to renown. Obviously, you are that lamp for others. I mean, I have to put that in there. As you said, for the beginning, you are... A light in the darkness, I would say, personally, I must say that. But how do you respond to that and even these kind of requests like myself today to interview you and how you respond to that on an internal level? We are not a proselytizing religion. Buddhism doesn't want to create more Buddhists. Mm -hmm. If you are a Christian, or a Muslim, or an atheist, or you believe in Star Wars. That is irrelevant to me. The fact that I'm a Buddhist is irrelevant to Zen. 
Zen means at its core awareness. So the, the, the word Zen, if you break it down, you look at the characters, essentially it means awareness, meditative awareness, deep awareness. I would rather, I remember once I was giving a talk to some Christians and, um, and they, were, they were a really great bunch of, of, of middle-aged, you know, some younger, some older, but they were really good. They were really open-minded. And, um, and I said, look, I'm not, I'm not here to give you some crazy Buddhist ideas. I'm here to make you see there are options for you to be better Christians. As a monk, as a Buddhist monk, I want you as a Christian, for example, to have that beating heart of Jesus Christ in your chest and act every single moment as though this is your chance to embody the depths of your beliefs. It's the same for Muslims, the same for Hindus, the same for atheists. Live every moment with awareness and you can't go wrong. It's when we start to become too identified with ourselves, too identified with our ideas, when we start to say, this is my hill and I'm going to die on it, that we're no longer travelling the world, we're standing on a dead hill. Um, as for fame, uh, I wish, no, I don't really wish to be completely honest, but um, my karma, my Roshi, my, my, my Zen master, so the Japanese word for Zen master is Roshi, my Zen master once said to me that my karma is that people really only understand my value once I'm gone. Um, and so I've never really had to deal with fame so much, and I'm thankful for that. Um, I know I could probably put on these robes and create my own cult. Um, I think that's probably the last thing I'd ever want to do. Um, I don't want to make money out of this. I don't want to make get my name on the front page of a newspaper for this. I want other people to realise that everything they need is right down at their feet and all they have to do is walk along that path. My master called me Daiju because Dai means big. It's Dai is the first character, which means Orki, big. And Ju, Ju is a great little character, it shows a tree and there's earth and under the earth is a seed and that seed is one inch long. And that character means that basically from the smallest seed grows the biggest tree. So my name Daiju can be translated as the biggest of the big trees or big tree. And I asked him about that and he said, well, there's two reasons why he considered calling me Daiju. He said one is because there's a bush that he heard about in Australia. It's only about a meter above the ground, but it's got roots that go down about 30, 40 meters. And he said, imagine having roots that deep that you are in touch with everything. Talking about spiritual roots, obviously. The other one and the one that he went to most, though, was to say that the biggest tree in the forest will accept anyone who needs a shade, who wants a place to rest. Even if they go to the toilet under the tree, it'll still provide them with that shade and will use the things that they think the most foul as a way to rebuild itself and to grow and to become even bigger, to provide more shade. So for me, that's probably the most powerful way of dealing with that. Fame, you can have as many Wikipedia pages as you want. You're still going to die. Your life will still be suffering. Um, and I've seen enough people on their deathbeds to know that sometimes it's the people that have the most that have the hardest giving it up in those last couple of minutes when you can't take any of it with you. And it's not I'm not talking about money. It's your dreams, your hopes, your wife, all the regrets you've had about if I'd only just said this, if I hadn't been so pig-headed about that, as those last breaths are rattling through. Fame means nothing if you're still carrying luggage that you're desperately trying to take with you when you go. Absolutely.
That makes a lot of sense, and it's but it has been fascinating me for the duration of this talk because I know that's not why you do any of this. I know that's a byproduct, but it's very interesting getting your perspective on that because you've experienced it. I would like to touch on the counselling work that you do as well because I would like to um, mention this a little bit to deepen people's understanding because especially with regards to mental health and some of the related topics, what you were saying earlier, substance abuse, some of these things, sadly in the world today, it's an epidemic. I mean, certainly I'd imagine um, with the work you do in Australia, it's very prevalent where I come from in the UK, incredibly prevalent, uh, worse than any virus, I would say. So I would like to touch on some advice and some topics related around that, but specifically advice for people who are struggling, not to be cliche about this, but I think that if people would like to work with you, they need to reach out with you. But because we have a global reach with this today, I hope that we can share maybe one or two things that they can start to apply because knowledge is only relevant if it's applied as, as you well know. So I would like to do that, but I would also like to find out more about your role. I know you're, you're not attached to the role, but it is a very valuable role that you play in this regard in terms of helping so many people. So there's a few different things that I've mentioned there. It's quite a broad topic, but to find out a little bit more about your counselling would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, I delineate quite clearly between chaplaincy, which is me as a, as a monk, obviously, as a Buddhist, um, and me as a counsellor, which is working with mental health ideas, working with mental health constructs. Interestingly, many of the ways that we Zen monks evolve in our training and see the world actually apply to modern techniques, uh, DBT, CBT, for example, which are very cognitive behavioural therapy, for, for example, is very similar in a way to the way that I see the world and experience the world. Um, and to, to, to briefly go into that, because I think, you know, not every, every one of our viewers is going to be as cognizant of what CBT, for example, means. If we, if we have ourselves and we have a, a strong emotion about something, um, I'm desperately afraid of doing this Zoom talk, I'm very nervous, I'm, I'm scared. That's how I'm feeling. But I'm seeing this Zoom talk as the cause of it and the reason for it. But really what it is that's causing that are my thoughts about it. So if you can imagine a line going from myself to those thoughts down to this Zoom talk, that's what's creating inside me this fear, this, this anxiety um, to, to use to use mental health terms, uh, I'm going to feel nervous, I'm going to feel anxious, I'm going to feel perhaps depressed that I've got to do this and it's just all too much. Um, some of us are going to act out because we're, it's easier to act out than it is to show, to show our fear or to admit to ourselves our fear. Cognitive behavioural therapy, which, we, which is one of the, the, the things we use in, in counselling, is to point out to our client, well, there's plenty of examples where you actually talk to people all day long. You might talk at work and be absolutely fine. But when it comes to a Zoom call, for example, it's suddenly hard. And it's those thoughts that are creating this, this fear for you. It's those thoughts which are actually the problem. So we train ourselves to live in the moment using mindfulness techniques. Obviously, I'm going to stick with Zen techniques, but... Um, we, we train ourselves to test those thoughts and to test our fears and see how valid they are because there's a Japanese saying which the, the answer is always in the question. And it's the same with a lot of mental health cases when someone comes to me as a counsellor. Often they know what the problem is and often they know what it is that they have to do, but they just need someone to give them that moment, just that moment to have a little bit more strength to go ahead with those steps that they have to do. Sometimes they need a little bit more clarity. I think it's also important to point out here 
um, there was a fantastic author called Ken Wilber, and uh, he studies Buddhist philosophy. He's a writer on Buddhist philosophy. I, I, I read quite a few of his works. And one of the things he talks about is if you can imagine an X and Y axes, and the X axes is our spiritual growth. Some of us are just bundles of ego. I'm here for me, 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 me. That's it. There's nothing more apart from me. It's just all me. All the way down to the Buddha, someone who's completely realized. But at the same time, we've also got the Y axis, which is our psychological axis. Some people are down here. They're just me, 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 completely ego. On the other hand, other people are perfectly understanding of themselves and the way that they act from a psychological point of view. Just because we are psychologically advanced, it doesn't necessarily mean we're spiritually advanced. And again, on the deathbed, it's often the, the opposite case. It's, it's those people who've worked so hard on their minds but haven't understood their spiritual connection that, that really struggle, I find, in those last moments. On the other hand, just because we've done this amazing Zen training, it doesn't mean that we're mature in any way, shape, or form. We were very lucky at the monastery. So I was in the monastery for a decade. Um, we were very lucky that I had uh, three times I was able to go through very intense psychoanalysis. I mean, I'm talking curled up in a ball, bawling, bawling my eyes out on the floor for hours, level of psychoanalysis. And for me, they were fantastic opportunities to work on that axis to round out this axis. So it's very important when we're having a, a mental health crisis to recognize what it is that we need. For some of us, it's just the acceptance. You need some rest, some time. You need to feel safe. You need to be heard. A lot of people come in and they want grand ideas and they want us to tell them what to do, but we're not there for that. We're there to allow them to guide themselves through and perhaps provide a few signposts along the way. Interestingly, that's the same as a Zen monk. Never ask, as the Japanese saying, um, never ask a monk a question. You'll just get more questions in return. I'm not here to give you a little box with a bow on the top and say, here's your enlightenment, it's yours, knock yourself out. If you don't have the burning passion to want to find that and to know what is the point of you living and breathing right now, if that's not important enough for you to burn to try and find it, then even if I gave it to you, you wouldn't even notice it. And this is why we say, getting back to something I said earlier, it's the student that finds the teacher. Because I can, I had a, a talk I did recently, it was a small one, it was only about 30, 40 people. And I said exactly the same thing. And I could see every person was being hit by it differently. And every person came up to me afterwards and mentioned aspects of my talk that hit them personally. But they were all completely different. I said just my thing. I just said, talked about my training, but each person interpreted it in terms of where they were at that point in time. So whether you're coming to me as a Zen monk or whether you're coming to me or others as a counsellor, we will find a way to talk to you in your own language and make sure that you can see your own path. Because often that's all we really need. We're often looking like this, but not often looking down here and thinking, you know, if I just take a few simple steps, I can start the ball rolling. We're too busy focused on the destination and the fact that we're not there yet. Um, I don't think I don't know much more of that, to be honest. Well, it's, it's a wonderful description because I do find the work you do so inspiring in breaking down these misunderstandings that people have. 
not to go off on a, on a tangent, but I very briefly, I do relate also personally with a number of things that you've said and a number of things that you've been through uh, in your, shall I say, your prior life um, before your death, as we were, we were talking about earlier. So it's um, definitely something that I feel very passionate about because so many people have these misunderstandings. Um, simply put that the answers are within and that similar to you, I mean, I've had all of this with, you know, anxiety, depression, uh, a lot of career success. You know, I was a, a celebrity photographer in the UK. I was a big, kind of a big deal in a way, you know, but none of it really brings happiness and so on. And I remember the first time uh, I met a, a monk and noticing how, how happy he was with nothing from a certain point of view. And then I, I remember asking, you know, how can I follow you? How can I learn about this? And you don't need to follow me. You need to watch your in-breath and your out-breath and look within. And I remember thinking, that, that can't be that, that can't be it. But obviously, as we now know, uh, it is so simple, but it works. And what you were saying there about people looking for grand ideas, people trying to reinvent the wheel, create something entirely different, um, trying to embrace new ideas because they're new and sometimes reject old ideas because they're old. It's not a very intelligent uh, format, I don't think. So what you were saying there about looking down at your feet, it's, it's a really beautiful uh, description and so simple, but people overlook it. I think that we are coming up on an hour roughly at this point. So before, before I let you go, because obviously it is late in your evening as well, are there any final words because feeding back to what you said earlier this could be the last time you you know you breathe and speak to somebody i mean i hope that uh, you continue for a long time but in, for the purposes of this zoom it might be the last time some people hear from you i hope that people reach out to you and connect with you in some way and i will say briefly to our audience please do that because obviously you can buy this man's books, he's on social media, you know, you're out there, you're not hard to find. So I will say I would advise people to, to follow you. But if there are any final words for our listeners this evening, please do share those and then I'll let you go because we've we've talked long enough and I've taken more than enough. I'm only, I'm only just warming up, actually. Once you get me on my Zen soapbox, I could go for hours, to be honest. But um Usually, uh, yeah, usually someone's calling time on me a couple of hours after I started. Um, yeah, I do have my book. So you've obviously got a, a guided course in Zen meditation. Um, so I'll give you a story from it. And I think this one is is quite a good, good story. Um, in uh, the, uh, quite some time ago, uh, about 100 years ago, uh, a Zen Buddhist monk was on a train traveling through the countryside. And in the same carriage as him uh, was a, a young man. And as they were traveling, the monk was sitting there quietly following his breath. Opposite him, this young man was getting more and more ag agitated. He was getting more and more stressed. Eventually, he had an outburst and he said to the, to the old monk, he said, he said, what do you do? What is your point? Look at me. I, I, I have children to enrich our country. I have a farm and I grow rice to, to sell to enrich our economy. He said, I put in together with my community and I build buildings and I dig ditches and I help people in times of need because that's how I help my community. And you don't even do that. You stay isolated away in your temple. What is the point of what you do? So the monk reached inside his pockets, and our pockets are in our sleeves, which are absolutely awesome. And he pulled out a little pocket watch. And he flipped open the lid, and he showed the man all the, the, the workings inside there. And he said... You, my friend, are like this pocket watch. You're like all those little gears that are working, each one of them working in synchronicity, each one of them doing their thing to make sure that the whole works. And for that, I thank you. Because without you, this watch wouldn't work. 
And he said, but if you look, there's also a lot of empty space. There's the empty space between the gears. There's the empty space in the holes of the gears. And without that empty space, this watch wouldn't work either. And that is my role. My role is to provide that empty space, to be those pauses in conversation or those, those pauses between notes and music that actually give it meaning. And he said, if everything was just empty space, there'd be nothing. If everything was just gears all crammed in there, nothing would move and it would just become completely dead. And in many ways, getting back to your question earlier of the mental health crisis we're going through, that's because our societies, especially here in the West, where we have everything we need, our lives are becoming so full that there's just not enough space for things to move around. And my job is to be there when someone needs to remember to take a breath and allow that space, allow that moment where things can start to move of their own accord again. So my... My final thing will be in the monastery, we, we have a, a big ball. It's called a hun, and it announces when the meditation sessions are about to sit. We strike it with a wooden mallet. It's not a pretty sound. It's a harsh sound. It's whack. And on it is written, the great matter of life and death. It pauses for no one. Time shoots like an arrow. If you haven't seen it yet, see it now. See it now. You are absolutely blessed, you, Liam, and people listening, to have this life. You do not know how incredibly rare and unfortunate you are to have this life. No matter how deep your suffering is at this point in time, you are alive. And there are people taking their last breaths right now who would give anything, all the riches in the world, to have an hour longer. Like you said, Liam, if you had one minute, you'd call the people up that you love to let them know that. There are people who are dying who would give anything for that. Absolutely. You might not like where you are, but you've got this chance to use it. If there's anything I can leave, it's that. Wow, that is beautiful and very true. I love some of the analogies that you've used at the description earlier of the axis, but also that story about the watch. It's so powerful because it's the first time I've heard that one, but that's why personally leaving the UK and coming out here a year ago uh, was a big part of it was for that reason, but that's such an enlightening description in and of itself. I will be listening to this back and taking notes, by the way. I hope you know that because... Uh, There'll be a test afterwards. <laughs> well, when, when I release this, it's wonderful as I'm doing it for others, but there's so many things I've personally gained, by the way, and I would like to just to briefly mention that because I'm still discovering my path. Obviously, I do identify as a Buddhist, and particularly in the beginning, um, Thich Nhat Hanh and his teachings were, was the person who sort of woke me up out of the stupor that I used to live in. But at the same time, I'm still discovering where to go with that. So personally, I would like to say a big thank you. I don't always say that, by the way, but I will say it today. And also for our audience and for our listeners, um, there's so much wisdom in there. And the most remarkable thing of all is that we've only scratched the surface in your life. I'm sure of that. But um, where we've had those fun and fascinating stories from your journey and the wisdom of your journey. And as you were saying at the beginning, you are that lamp, you are that light in the darkness. So I know that you won't identify with that for very good reason, but nonetheless, what you do, it does touch so many, many lives. So I bid you a wonderful evening. I will bow again and thank you so, so much for- Absolute pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. It's an absolute pleasure. And my best wishes to your family as well. Have a great evening. And thank you again so much for your time, my friend. Thank you.
thank you very much for watching um, please subscribe to the simply inspired youtube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon